So um, maybe you can start the record if you wish. I just did that. Okay, okay. So um, hi, thanks a lot for joining our webinar today. My name is Paolo. I'm a chair of uh, Bridging Science and Business Working Group of uh, MCAA, Mariki Alumni Association. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, it was unexpected, but let's start. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. His name is Vinesh Yana Kiraman, and he's an experienced biotechnology professional. He's presently working with the Rulia Group on expanding the business internationally. Prior to that, he worked with two startups in the biotechnology sector, including his own venture in life sciences to bring about affordable hemophilia therapy in India. He's been also an interesting part of the biotech entrepreneurial ecosystem in both France and in India. He holds a doctorate and business degrees from the University of Bordeaux uh, and uh, INSEED, respectively. So um, we'll now start the presentation. You can please ask your questions in the chat. So there's a chat uh, uh, function here. There's also a raise uh, hand um, option in, in case you want to maybe ask a question uh, while we go. But uh, unless, otherwise, we can leave the questions till the end. Also, in the end, uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself, so you can also ask a question by speech if you wish. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Vinesh, so he can try to share his presentation now. And I will monitor the questions when once while we go, and then in the end, uh, we'll get to the question and answer. Uh, part okay, so we can see a presentation now. Perfect. So now I will go hide myself. So uh, <laughs> Vinesh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you so much, Pablo. Thanks again for inviting me and having me over. It's it's always a pleasure to talk with uh, more people and sharing my experience. Uh, so, like Pablo said, I will keep my presentation really short. Uh, I'll probably end up talking for 20 to 30 minutes and the more interactive we are, the better it would be. So if you have any questions at any moment, just put it into the meeting chat and then once I finish off quickly, we can we can make it more into a conversation rather than just one person blabbering at my end. Um, so good afternoon, my name is Vignesh. Uh, I am presently working with, uh, with a French conglomerate called the Rulier Group. Uh, it's based out of Saint Malo, which is where I live, uh, and uh, I work for one of their subsidiaries called Timac Agro. We're into the agri-food business, but my vast majority of my experience comes from biotechnology, from life sciences, including my attempts to translate my own research work into a viable business, which I beautifully failed. So, which is one of the key things that I'll be talking about in my presentation today, and hence also the title of my talk, Lost in Translation, where uh, we as people with uh, life sciences background, more specifically life scientists, uh, on a few key points where we miss out while we are working on translating what was once an idea into something really palpable. So, I'll probably start with a very brief background about myself. I'm Indian. I was born in Chennai, in the, in the southern part of India. And uh, in 2011 to 15, I actually did a joint PhD, which was the first Thaison Cotutel between India and France. My research thesis was focused on uh, the high density lipoprotein uh, in cardiovascular disorders. And my doctoral thesis was focused on generating recombinant apolipoprotein A1 using the yeast Picapastoris. Uh, and before that, during my master's, I had also worked on generating coagulation factor eight using the same Pichia pastoris uh, and on purifying coagulation factor eight from human blood plasma. The reason I'm going into details on what I had worked on uh, is because that's what gave way to my first startup. Uh, right after I finished my PhD, I got a seed funding from the Indian government uh, in the form of a grant. So I got to keep all my equity. Uh, to develop an affordable hemophilia therapy in India. Uh, so this was a direct translation of the master's work that I had done, uh, in which my lab owned a patent of which I was an inventor. I was the lead inventor. And subsequently we worked on, I built my first tiny team. Uh, we worked on establishing the initial proof of concept. And then of course this was in the biotherapeutic domain. So it required a lot more funding before it could turn into a viable business into uh, a larger scale 
uh, business and unfortunately I was not able to secure the funds that were required. I'll touch upon these uh, what all went wrong uh, during my plasma tech experience but also what is really interesting is that it basically shaped the way I started looking at things and it was an enormous learning experience. So towards the end of my time with Plasma Tech, I was looking for another opportunity to come back to Europe because I really enjoyed my time while I was doing my PhD. And uh, I knew somebody who knew somebody who was looking for somebody like me. That's pretty much how things happen when you're looking for another job. So I got in touch with Algo Biotech, which is a life sciences startup. They're a biotech company based out of the Genopole Biocluster, which is south of Paris. And uh, from 2017 to 2020, I worked with Algo Biotech as their scientific director. Uh, but since it was a small startup, I also had the good opportunity to basically work on a number of other things in business development in basically pivoting the company on to another direction. And while I was at Algo Biotech, I also had the good opportunity to study at NCAD. I did what is known as a business foundation certificate. Uh, it's a part time program that helps people with non business backgrounds uh, to really equip themselves with what they want in the in the business uh, aspects of it, basically. And finally, since the beginning of this year, I've been with the Rulia group, more notably their subsidiary Timaka group uh, based out of Samalo. It's a beautiful town. I would certainly invite you all to visit. And I am basically presently involved in uh, setting up their India operations. So I'm involved in international development. Uh, the domain, of course, over the period of time, I've gradually shifted from biopharma onto uh, microalgae onto agro supplies. So it's it's been quite a drastic shift. And I've also moved from someone who was working actively on the bench towards someone who's in a purely commercial role right now. And uh, though I do work for a big company, uh, my role is more of that of an intrapreneur. Uh, so to say, uh, what I will be starting in India is pretty much like a startup. I would be setting up operations from scratch. Uh, but of course, with the good fortune of having the parent company to back me both financially and to support me. So I have all the mentors that I need internally. Uh, so that's just to give you a brief background of who I am, what I've done, where I stand today. Uh, and uh, so I'll move on further into the topic. So this is typically something that most of you or all of you, I would assume, would know by default because a startup typically stems with an idea uh, and something that's focused on addressing a particular problem. It requires planning strategy and then you get your first customers, you fund your uh, project and then you know you hit your target with a bullseye and you have success. That's how you become a unicorn. That's extraordinary oversimplification of what the process is. But this pretty much sums up what a startup life involves. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to make a, a base assumption that you're all aware of this workflow, so to say. And what I would instead do is to focus on particular pain points that we would anticipate more so for a startup that's uh, in the domain of biotech or into biopharma, but more generally into biotech, be it medical devices or into, into biotechnology. So in the world of life sciences, there are a few additional uh, issues that do get added up. And so on my talk today, I will focus more particularly on these four topics. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the reasons for finishing my talk in just half the allotted time is so that uh, we can discuss more issues that uh, you probably are facing, you probably anticipate in your efforts to start your new venture. So it would be really good to touch upon what I am not uh, talking about during the course of my talk. Uh, so the first and foremost issue that differentiates life sciences startups is the need for capital. Uh, as long as we are researchers, as long as we are in a research laboratory, especially in biotech, we are quite used to having a centrifuge around, you know, anything you need from a cold room to extracting a DNA is just, you know, a, a couple of hours manipulation in the bench. 
But when you become a company and you are a separate entity, uh, when you're a startup, every single thing costs a bomb and you're not going to be able to uh, bootstrap that all the way. It's not something that, you know, just a couple of geeks with laptops, you open your shop in the garage and found Apple. Uh, life sciences doesn't work that way. You are extraordinarily dependent on infrastructure. Uh, so we are often more often than not at the mercy of uh, funding agencies and uh, you know dedicated startup support systems. Now these were a lot more complicated, I would say, probably 10 years ago, a little less complicated five years ago, but have really smoothened out by this time. So you do have a number of avenues to explore, uh, which are really supportive. And the world of corporate companies also has become more transparent than it used to. So for example, just to be honest, while I was working on my plasma tech idea, uh, while I was working on hemophilia therapy in India, uh, I was able to discuss with people from Baxalta uh, in Austria, with people from LFP in France, uh, who were not necessarily just looking at me as competition, but as somebody who show promise and are happy to share their knowledge in the domain, of course, within what doesn't conflict their business interests, with always with an open vision that maybe, you know, one day they would be willing to buy you out or to integrate what you are doing into their company or just let you live on as you do. Uh, not everybody is out there to steal your uh, billion dollar idea. That's actually something that when you are venturing out into starting uh, a new startup, you have to keep that in mind. Not everyone is around to steal your idea. Uh, a second aspect that gets talked a lot, more specifically uh, pertaining to biotechnology, is patents. There is, of course, an increasing need to protect your unique solution, uh, but just filing a patent or even you know defending your patent, getting it awarded, uh, is not the end of the road. The objective of any patent is to make money out of it. Uh, and that is only when you license it or you make extraordinary revenue out of it. So it's something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, and I will definitely talk about in greater detail on patents and probably try to bust a few myths around it. Uh, I personally have two patents that have been awarded in Europe. I think we're in the process of doing country filings. Uh, I am basically an inventor in those patents. So there's also the difference of who owns the patent and who invented uh, to the, the, the invention that got patented in the first place. Uh, and uh, a third point that I would touch upon is uh, the ability to think more in terms of businesses. Uh, if you talk about startups, you always have, and more particularly for people in life sciences, any scientist per se, I would say, is quite attached to the research work that they're doing because it's something that we are proud of, uh, something that you know uh, came out of our efforts, hard work out on the bench and into something that would be fantastic. So we have a tendency to get emotionally attached to it, if I can put it that way. I'm speaking from my experience. I'm not trying to generalize it, but we do have a tendency to be attached to what we've worked on. And that sometimes could cloud your uh, decision making process because in the world of business, you have to be cutthroat. And what matters at the end of the day is the bottom line. It's whether your company is going to make money. And that's all investors care about, regardless of what background they come out of, because they're not here to make charity donations and they're not giving away grants. They are actually investing and an investment by default requires returns. And the last topic is, of course, the quagmire that is academia. We've all been through it uh, in varying degrees and the chances of working with a supervisor who is fantastic. I've actually honestly had the good fortune of working with a fantastic supervisor while I was in Bordeaux. Uh, is quite rare though. Uh, so how your relationship with your former mentor, with your former lab, where perhaps part of the invention came from, or the lab where which owns the IP that you're trying to uh, license into and exploit. Uh, these are also additional uh, points that you would need to consider. 
uh, especially when you're in life sciences and the more clarity you have uh, earlier on the better it is on uh, along your journey and that i think is quite crucial so on the first uh, topic on life sciences being capital intensive uh, so like i said starting up isn't really as complicated anymore you have a number of accelerator programs, uh, a lot of uh, support. Like, for example, when I did start my startup in India, uh, I was actually funded by this agency called BIRAC, which is the Biotechnology Industry Research Association Council. It's a government body that basically hands out $100,000 uh, worth of grant to somebody who just comes to them with an idea. I have an idea, give me 18 months, give me $100,000 uh, to basically show proof of concept. And then they have more solutions to help you along the way. Uh, but back in my time, definitely one of the key problems that I faced with this was uh, the delay in disbursement. Any government grant takes its time to reach its people, which is normal. And also it was in its earlier stages with time. There's, there's always the initial teething problem whenever there's a new scheme that comes out. It's definitely more smooth and out now. Uh, and similarly, uh, like in India, there are plenty of opportunities right here in Europe. So if you're based out of France, especially if you're in the Parisian region, uh, to begin with, uh, you have the Genopole Biocluster, which is quite a fantastic place to be because you have a number of thriving startups. That's where Algo Biotech was. And they have a couple of schemes for the initial phase, be it you just a master's student who's just graduated. You might be a doctoral person. You might have just finished your first postdoc and you're thinking, you know what, I think I need to start something because I have a really interesting idea. Uh, they have this program called the Shaker that gives you six months of uh, free rental access to wet lab space and uh, intensive mentoring to basically get you pushed in the right direction to start thinking about business concepts on how you're going to become profitable, how you're going to make money and how you find your customers. Uh, because that's another problem that I will come into uh, just a bit further down. And apart from uh, Genopole, you also have uh, uh, Station F. That's basically right in the center of Paris. And Station F has a number of programs. Their mantra is basically, uh, we want a huge uh, factory like open space with the best possible thinking minds conglomerate together. So if you are someone who's passionate about starting up and you know you have an idea, but you don't have a co-founder to work with, you can really focus, you can work with entrepreneur first, for example. So you can check out uh, EF, they have uh, a six week long uh, intensive program where you can find a co-founder for your startup and get working on. They give you a stipend for the period that you're working. They have on campus housing. So EF is actually one of the programs right within Station F. Station F is more like a place where you have people on all domains. So uh, that's another avenue to look at. And then you have IndieBio, you have uh, VOSV, you have plenty of uh, venture capital funds who have accelerator programs. So if it's something in particular that you're looking, of, looking for, please do feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to discuss with you in greater detail on what you're looking at and try and orient you more towards uh, who could be a better help for you. And uh, so, like I said, starting up is not really as complicated anymore. All you need is an idea and the motivation to really keep working. There's always a solution. You just have to keep looking. Uh, and this is one topic that I like to take a little time to actually yap about a little because I've had a lot of firsthand experience over the last six, seven years working firsthand on patents from all the way from filing to not making money from them. Uh, so. At the outside, I think patents are overrated. I'm not saying they're useless. Patents are very useful, but you have to really understand what patents are for. Patents are basically meant to give somebody monopoly. It's basically to say you have a novel molecule to treat diabetes. I mean, forget insulin, say you have not a homolog, but you have a completely new molecule that can treat diabetes. And you say, well, I want to be the only person who's allowed to produce this or anybody who wants to produce it, 
better pay me and produce it. It gives you monopoly. That's the whole purpose of a patent. And a patent uh, specification is a legal document. It's not necessarily a scientific document. So uh, it's written by lawyers. The people who make the best money in the world of patents are patent attorneys. Uh, <laughs> they probably make more money than people who end up licensing their patents even. So uh, I, I just wanted to quickly run you through uh, the life cycle of a patent so that you know you get a deeper understanding of what it actually is and you are better informed when you think about filing your next patent or you know going ahead with uh, understanding what the, the value of a patent is. So a patent basically stems from an initial uh, invention. So they have three aspects that need to be checked, that it needs to be novel, it needs to be inventive, and it needs to be industrially applicable because the whole purpose of a patent, like I said, is uh, for monopoly, is for making money. So if your patent can't be industrialized, there's no point in having a patent on it. And similarly, it should be something that's new and it should be inventive. And by default, all patents are published at the end of 18 months, unless you withdraw your application before it's published. So, which is one reason why, for example, Coca-Cola does not patent its uh, secret formula. They'd rather keep it as a trade secret because if they had patented it after 18 months, it's available open in the public. So, you know, uh, it, it's a whole different subject on how you go around searching patents, etc. But it's a very straightforward activity. You can Google patents is way open. Uh, it takes no time. All you need to identify is who filed the patent or just the keywords, etc. And then uh, what's also important is patents are as they are legal. They're defined by the countries where you file them. So if you file a patent in India, it's valid only in India. So the monopoly that I was talking about is awarded only in India. But if you say and how it traditionally happened was you file a patent in India, your own patent becomes prior art uh, for a filing for a future filing you might want to do in, say, Europe. So you file it in India in 2020 and say next year you say I want to protect this in Europe as well. Uh, your own document in India prevents you from patenting it in Europe. But there is a way to circumvent that. It's called the Patent Cooperation Treaty. It's like a collection of 140 countries, which all got together and said, well, you know, if you file a patent in India, you can conserve your priority date. That's from when uh, uh, your patent is valid from. Will be maintained as long as you do a, an extension into a country that's covered by the PCT. And a very important thing that you need to understand is all of the all of these activities are money consuming. So, for example, just to give you a ballpark number, uh, filing your first patent is not very expensive, probably for a few thousand euros if you want to hire a good attorney and to do the proper paperwork and, you know, write your claims well, etc. And but by the time you get to the PCT expansion, for say uh, six to seven countries, if you want to cover it, uh, it's going to cost you anywhere between 15 to 20,000 euros. So it's it's a real budget that you have to count. And uh, uh, if you also look at uh, large companies, for example, pharma companies, they file hundreds and thousands of patents every year. But what you should also notice is that not a lot of those patents are taken all the way until it's granted. They don't bother uh, expanding it to other countries or uh, they file the patent when they see that there is a potential. And then with time, if it doesn't look like the research is really supporting that potential, they drop a patent. It happens all the time. So it's really important to understand uh, that patents are money consuming. So you would you would want to invest in it only when you know that you're going to make money out of it. And then there's the question of maintenance fee. For example, in Europe, you have to start pay paying maintenance fees from even before your patent is awarded. By the way, from the time you file the patent to the time it's awarded, uh, you can count anywhere between four to six years, depending on which country you have applied for the patent in. For example, uh, an Indian patent that was filed uh, in which I was an inventor back in 2012 was finally awarded last year. So just to give you an idea. 
and uh, like i said patents uh, give you a monopoly for a fixed timeline so all patents expire at the end of 20 years it's a whole different story and folklore why they fix 20 years it comes from milan uh, from tennis uh, but uh, patents expire in 20 years and that includes the time it took for you to get the patent awarded in the first place. So it's it's a lot more complicated than it might appear at the outside. Uh, and you basically make money for the period that you license it till the time it expires. So also the reason we have a lot of biosimilars and genetics uh, is because pharma patents expired at the beginning of the millennia. That's how other people could start producing it. And that's what brought down the value of the drug. So uh, the, the key take home that I wanted to give out in this is that for a biotech company, uh, it is definitely important to look at uh, building an intellectual property around your invention, uh, be it a medical device, be it a new drug, whatever your uh, startup might be focused on. Do make sure that you have a patent to protect it for two good reasons. Uh, if there's a bigger player in the domain who's interested in, you know, investing in your company and taking you over, they wouldn't do it unless there's a patent uh, that protects the technology because they have the power to defend it. Uh, and secondly, uh, it also gives you a better visibility in front of your investors uh, who do care for patents. But for how long you maintain the patent and uh, you should always keep it as a goal to license it as soon as possible so that you start generating revenue and you're not just spending money on that. So it's just these two points that I would uh, like you to keep in mind when it comes to patents. Uh, the third point that I was talking about in looking at business as a business. Uh, me, if for me, when I started off Plasmatech, uh, the financial aspects of it was quite mind boggling. I did not have a co-founder who came with a finance background, uh, someone with a business background. No, I had to actually learn everything from scratch, managing my cash flows to projecting what potential revenue I might make in the future. Uh, it was it's definitely the best way to learn it, but it's a slow and a really hard process. So you do need to keep in mind that the purpose of a company is always to make money. Uh, that's that's the definition of an enterprise. You need to make money for your investors, for your shareholders. If you own all of your company, you're making money for yourself. Uh, so you also need to understand there's a key difference between an innovator and an entrepreneur. Uh, an innovator, sure, he finds innovative solutions but an entrepreneur finds a business case for that solution. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need a pain point. You need someone who's willing to buy, who's willing to pay for what you've invented, for what, you've, what you're providing. So you don't always need to be extraordinarily unique in your solution, as long as you have a solution for which somebody is willing to pay for it. Maybe it's in the way that you're pro providing it. Maybe it's in the way that, uh, that no one else has done it in the past or maybe you know another 10 people will copy it right after you make it uh, but nevertheless as long as you have someone who's willing to uh, pay you for the solution that you have to provide it's a viable business and uh, a second key point is to make sure that you start thinking about generating revenues early on. So this was again a mistake I did with Plasmatech. I was so focused on purifying clotting factor eight for hemophilia therapy that we did start burning a lot of cash and we did get to the point of proving proof of concept, but then we didn't have any revenue stream coming in. So for example, in India, the plasma logistics market is quite a heavy, uh, quite a big business in itself. So uh, one thing in retrospect, I since I did have the right contacts, I could have started transporting plasma for other fractionators, for example, which would have made me a service company as well, which would have started generating some form of revenue, which would have given more confidence to investors to say, you know what, even if 
the main project with which the company was born, the main idea with which it was born does not work. There's always a plan B and a plan C, and it's not like I have to wait for plan A to fail in order to go into plan B. You need to have multiple directions of thoughts and multiple ways of generating revenue. Uh, because first you need revenue and then you can think about profits. So you need to always have a business strategy with fail safes and be aware of your risks uh, right from the beginning. And uh, a third aspect is to build a solid board, be it your company's board of advisors or just an, an advisory committee, someone who does not control you but gives you sound advice. You need to surround you with people who can strategically help you. Uh, so to me, that made a huge difference. Uh, and also when you are small, you have nothing to lose. Uh, people are open to help uh, other aspiring people out. So always get into touch with, uh, with people. You have to not limit yourself. You don't have to divulge everything that you're working on, but you should be open to talking with other people. And lastly, don't be just dependent on grants. I mean, it's always good. Grants are always welcome because it's money that comes without any strings attached on it. It's it's equity free. You still have, you can still build more value into your company without having to give a part of your pound of your flesh. Uh, but the thing is, if you are dependent purely on them, you are at the mercy of bureaucrats who are responsible for administering it. And that is something that you should try to avoid because your business problem is not going to wait for money to flow in from whatever funding agency you're waiting on. So don't just stay dependent on them. It's always a welcome bonus. Uh, the last point, I don't think I want to uh, stress too much on this. Uh, you should also be able to take decisions on your own to say, well, you know what, this is my company. This is how I want to run it. And uh, it was one of the toughest choices I made when I moved out of the lab. I was in India to to move Plasma Tech elsewhere because I was entangled in a reasonable amount of web with my mentor out there. Uh, and it takes a little bit of tough choices. Uh, I'm sure everybody has gone through it to different extents, but you should be able to you know, isolate yourself, be a little selfish and see what's best for your company and make your decisions on it. Might you end up burning a few bridges along the way? Yes, but in this, in today's world, nobody is really, uh, you know, dependent on anybody. There's always, the world is more open than it used to be. And I've always had a lot of support. Uh, and even with the person with whom I did not leave on good terms that day, I have a fantastic relation today. So it's there's we don't live in a pure black and white world is is all I'm trying to say that you need to be more open in uh, in also taking what decisions that are more important for the future of your company. So just to really rapidly summarize, uh, if you want to start up in biotech, you need to have uh, four good points is all I think of. Uh, you need a great founding team. It's always good to have people with complementary expertise. So if you are really specialized in the bench side of it, if you are a technical expert, get on board somebody who understands business and numbers and what who would be able to objectively look at customer pain points. That way you don't infringe on each other's zones. You, you have an authority set between the two of you that person doesn't question you for your science. You don't question them for their business acumen. So that way you have a perfect complementarity and you can have the occasional conflicts. Conflicts are good. They help you really, you know, open up and think more openly about what you're doing. And make friends with people. Look on LinkedIn, network with a lot of people. Even today in my role at Timak Agro, a lot of people in the agriculture domain in India that I want to get in touch with. I reach out to them. I send them an, uh, you know, uh, an invite on LinkedIn. You don't even need a professional account to do it. You can just send them a connection request with a note. Always do personalize it. That matters. And people by default are nice. I think I, <laughs> there's still hope in humanity. Not everybody is, uh, you know, maybe you reach out to 10 people. Two people might say, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. 
go on do whatever you have to. Uh, but the remaining eight people will definitely take out five minutes to help you with that problem that you're having. So always reach out to more people and uh, be opportunistic. Always have your eyes and ears open. You never know where, what. So when I joined in Algobiotech, our focus was on on building a cosmetic line and uh, in using alkyl extracts to prepare cosmetics. Uh, but uh, with time, our food colorant project progressed so well that at one point we actually managed to pivot the company and focus more on that. So you should always be open to uh, new opportunities where people are willing to invest in etc and do not hesitate too much into shifting your mode of functioning and uh, the last thing of course you got to have some money to run it <laughs> the world does not run for free so always stay open for uh, future sources of funding uh, if you want money six months today is when you have to like really fight out to make sure that you have that money in place even longer actually, but but you've got to always foresee upfront without losing track of it. You got all of this, you have a legacy to build. I'm still failing. I would hopefully fill, build one day, hopefully not too far into the future. Uh, so thanks a lot for listening quite so patiently. Uh, I will also open up the chats on the side. So like Pavlo said, please ask your questions there or you have the, the feature to raise your hand. Uh, and you know we you could ask a question live on the call and I will answer it and independent of that you have my email ID and my LinkedIn profile so feel free to connect with me uh, I'll be more than happy to discuss with you in greater detail if you'd like thanks a lot thank you Vinyash uh, for the very nice presentation and uh, inspiring information and your life story to share with us that you share with us uh, so I did ask people to uh, please write your questions in the chat. If you have any, you can also raise your hand or you can unmute yourself now. Uh, is it possible, Vinyash, to unmute? Yeah, I think people should be able to. Okay. Possibly unmute. So uh, yes. maybe there are some questions which could be asked uh, by the participants now uh, by speech. If somebody wants to go first. Somebody trying to unmute yourself or no questions? Uh, there's just one additional point that I wanted to add. So if you are in the agri sector, if you work in plant nutrition or in animal nutrition and uh, you have an inventive idea or you've you know, been running your own startup in this sector or if you come from an agricultural background, if your family, you, there are farmers in them and so on and if you're under 32 years of age please do get in touch with me we have uh, some interesting things that are in development at the rulia group and we would certainly love to discuss in greater detail with you so i'm just leaving that as another added statement to you uh, if any of you have anything in particular that you would like to discuss i'm all ears Maybe I can ask uh, one of the first questions. Um, yes, please. Do you think uh, there are some differences for this workflow of patent, no patent, uh, based on where you are? For example, Asia, Europe, like India, France, or within Europe? Or is it universal uh, the way it works? The way it works is pretty much universal. I mean, of course, it costs lesser to file a patent in India than it does in Europe because uh, the you have the fees and then also the cost of hiring an attorney and a patent agent to file it on your behalf and so on. But other than that, the workflow is pretty much uniform. You have uh, the first 30 months when you decide if you want to, you know, uh, no, you have the first 18 months to decide if you want to just stay in the country where you filed it or if you want to protect it across other jurisdictions as well. Uh, but other than that, um, there's also the point of enforcing patents. So the big advantage of a patent is if somebody infringes on your patent, you can sue them. Like I said, it's a legal document. But the difficulty and the complication in suing somebody, for example, in China or in India is quite difficult. 
the judicial system has its own backlogs and then the governments are not uh, sometimes as pro in proactively supporting a foreign entity to come and fight the, in their courts. So uh, you would also have to pick your battles, right? You'd have to see uh, if it makes sense for you strategically to protect your intellectual property in a particular country. Uh, I just have a question from Ali Haider. Uh, no, the patent duration is always 20 years. You do not lose the right of your invention after 18 months. Your patent gets published at 18 months from when you filed it. Uh, so it's there's, it's an open registry. You have the European Patent Office, you have WIPO, which is the world agency, and you also have, uh, you know, in the USPTO, for example. So it gets published, so anybody can see your invention, can see the details of your patent, figures, everything, uh, whatever is available. The, the comments of uh, an examiner who evaluated your patent, every detail is available online after 18 months uh, as it progresses. Uh, do you have any recommendations to get access to relevant market data on how to perform market research in biotech in general? So there are two ways. Uh, if you have six to eight thousand euros to spare, uh, you will always find plenty of marketing agencies, consulting agencies that will tell you that you can buy reports on that. For example, at Algo Biotech, I was working on FICO sign in, so I got contacted by at least six or seven different market agencies, uh, which basically say, you know, we'll do a landscape of which players are there in the world, etc. Uh, I am personally not a fan of them. Uh, the best way to do it is to identify key stakeholders. So you need to identify which companies work in that domain. You need to identify which uh, people, uh, which scientists in that sector are renowned for it. Uh, reach out to them, email them directly, uh, reach out to them on LinkedIn, and you need to talk with more people. The best way to get uh, market data is by talking with stakeholders at various levels because also when you look at reports it gives you a global picture it does not show the day-to-day -day reality of what goes on uh, at the ground level so you would have to uh, be open to getting more perspectives on things and reach out to as many people as possible Uh, and maybe I can ask, also ask uh, the thing. There are also um, differences to the approach which you should follow if you are in a different industry. Like you, can, you speak from your industry, but I think it's right. also translatable to other industries. Absolutely, uh, it's definitely translatable to others, uh, and it it really every industry industry also has its own uh, specifics on what works and what does not work. I just shared my experience on on life sciences, uh, especially on the on, on the side of the patents and on the capital intensiveness of it. Uh, but uh, if there are a few aspects that are of course common across industries, but you would being an expert in your uh, domain of science or mathematics or whatever it might be. Uh, you would have a better understanding of how it works in your domain. But the business fundamentals at the end of the day always remain the same. Maybe there are now some uh, questions which could be asked by speech if somebody wants to chip in. Otherwise, um, yeah. oh, I'm really <laughs> out of questions right now. That was a <laughs> clear presentation for me. But, Not a problem. Um, so in all cases, uh, you have my email ID and you have my LinkedIn profile. So feel free to connect with me. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer more questions or, you know, just bounce off ideas to, to talk. It's, it's always a pleasure. Then um, I think it's a good way uh, to end this uh, webinar. Um, thanks a lot, Vinesh. Perfect. And, thanks uh, a lot. Yeah, so um, I will share the presentation uh, later as yes, well, please. and then we also uh, 
put the recording of this webinar on our playlist in case you are interested still uh, to know more. And then um, thanks a lot for joining and thank you, Vinesh, for, for uh, your presentation. Thank you, Pablo. It was a pleasure to be here all day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.